All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants Hangout. My name is Alicia, and I'll be your host for today. We're really excited to be joined by Rachel Bell Irving at the Vancouver Aquarium, who's going to talk to us today about plastic in the ocean. So hi, Rachel. Hi, Alicia. Hi, everybody. I hope you're having a good morning so far. Uh, as Alicia said, my name is Rachel, and yes, I am here at the Vancouver Aquarium. We're located on the western side of Canada in Vancouver, B.C., we're on the traditional territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh First Nations peoples. So we are right in the heart of a rainforest, both on land and underwater. And as an ocean-wise initiative, Vancouver Aquarium is a home for research and for rehabilitation of animals, as well as conservation and education. So we like to share the amazing underwater world uh, with you as much as we can. Today, we're gonna talk about one of those biggest threats that we're currently seeing in the ocean, which of course is ocean plastics and plastics is a pretty hot topic nowadays. It's something that we're finally starting to realize just how much plastic there is to the point where humans really can't live without it. And I'm currently in a very special exhibit. I'm actually in an art exhibit inside an aquarium, which is very exciting for us because we're managing to combine arts, visual arts with science, which is one of the greatest collaborations that has been happening for many, many, many years. And we don't often think about just how incredible art can be when trying to communicate these really powerful subjects like plastic pollution. So this art exhibit was done by an artist named Douglas Copeland. He is originally a Canadian artist, but he's worked all over the world, particularly in something called pop art, which is why you see some very uh, bold things behind me. And all of this stuff is looking at plastics in the ocean, how it travels across the world uh, and things like that. So the very first thing that I would like to start is warm up our plastic radars a bit, because as I mentioned, plastic is everywhere. Humans have a really hard time living without it. It's one of, I think, personally, the greatest inventions of all kinds because it can be transformed into things that are soft or hard or lots of different shapes and sizes. So as a warm up, I would like you to point to something at the count of three, point to something made out of plastic. One, two, three, point. Woo, great, we've got hands going all over the place. This is awesome. So some of you might have pointed uh, to supplies in your classrooms. Some of you might have pointed to the chairs that you're sitting on. I see a couple of those chairs. Some of you might have even pointed to yourself if you've got glasses. My glasses on my desk are made out of plastic. And also as well, one thing that we often miss is our clothing. Our clothing is made out of plastic as well. Plastic is so transformative, so cool. We're able to turn plastic into fiber to make clothing. So before I talk about plastic and kind of the research we're doing, I'd like you to give, I'm gonna give you a minute, help your friends look at your own tags and see what your actual clothing is made out of. What are the ingredients in your clothes? So I'm gonna give you a minute to do that and check your tags and see what you can find. I know I've got, I think I've got polyester in mine. Actually, that's a great question, what do I have? Here we go. Yeah, I do. I've got polyester and I've got spandex. <laughs> I'm glad to see I see lots of people helping each other out. That's very helpful. Sometimes those tags are in weird places that are hard to get to. <laughs> awesome. So if you've had a chance to look around, you can keep looking. I'm going to keep talking. Uh, some of the ingredients you might have seen, if you've seen cotton, cool, that's a pretty natural fiber. If you saw anything like polyester, spandex, that's what's actually in my vest right now. If you've seen anything that is acrylic, all of those kind of things that are cotton or fleece actually is also part of plastic cycle. They're all made of plastic. They're all made of synthetic fibers. Synthetic means man-made. So we're able to, even able to transform plastic into cotton into fibers, sorry, into clothing, which is amazing. So plastic is a huge part of our everyday lives, but to the point where now we're starting to realize just how much we're using, and that's where it's becoming a problem. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna share a few photos with you, uh, mostly of the research that we're doing. You're gonna see Alicia's face for just a wonderful second there. Hello. Uh, so we're gonna talk about plastics. So plastics, of course, like I said, they are able to transport themselves around the world thanks to waves, thanks to the weather. Uh, and as they get into the ocean, 
Plastics can be a number of different challenges. Oftentimes when we talk about plastic pollution, the very first thing people think about are the big animals getting stuck in plastic. So this is a picture of a female stellar sea lion, and this is one of the disentanglement projects that we do. So as on top of our marine mammal rescue team, what they do is they rescue oftentimes abandoned or injured animals like seals. They'll also go out and do disentanglement efforts. So this is one of the seals that we went out with our vet team uh, and actually cut loose that plastic strap that you see around her neck. So this is what many people think about as plastics is the big, really cool animals like seals, like sharks, like turtles, uh, whales eating plastic, which was recently in the news. So big pieces of plastic are a big challenge. But the tricky part about plastics is because they're man-made, they don't ever break down, they just break up into littler and littler pieces. So you get, thanks to the waves and the salt uh, and the sunlight, it breaks apart those pieces of plastic into what we call microplastics. So if you take a look at your pinky finger and you see that little white line of nail on your pinky finger, that is roughly the size of microplastics. They're generally around five millimeters or smaller, more like the grain of rice or smaller. So they're tiny, tiny, tiny little pieces of plastic and they just continue to get smaller as they persist in the ocean. Uh, and there's different types of microplastics. Sometimes microplastics are actually, or plastics are made to be tiny. So nurdles are those little, little pellets of plastic that are actually designed to be tiny. And nurdles are transported all around the world to be the building blocks for bigger pieces of plastic. So we will ship containers of nurdles across the ocean to then be used to build plastic bottles, plastic bags, anything you can think of. The nurdles are building blocks for just bigger pieces of plastic. And then microbeads, which luckily are now banned in Canada and a couple other countries are following suit. Uh, these microbeads, again, are designed to be small. We usually find them in our face scrubs or our toothpaste. If you've ever had toothpaste that had those little white strips in it, those are actually plastics. <laughs> and they're really helpful normally for scrubbing our teeth. But moving forward, we can find more natural alternatives. And then we've got secondary microplastics, which are those fibers, which you looked at in your clothes, and the fragments, so those pieces of plastic that are broken off from the bigger pieces of plastic. And this is what's really scary for humans is that these microplastics are now a challenge for animals at all levels of the food chain. It can start in our clothes, it can be airborne from the factories, or it goes through our waste treatment facilities. So no matter where you are in the world, whether you live right beside the ocean, a lake, or a river, or even if you're in a city that has no water anywhere near it, you still have storm drains. And those are all areas where water will go into that'll connect through our water filtration systems that'll eventually get back to the ocean. It's all part of the water cycle. It's why we're all connected. Uh, and it's also why things like chemicals or plastics are able to transport around the world. So everybody is connected to this system. And it means that our waste can make its way into the ocean. So little pieces of plastic can end up uh, being eaten by these smaller animals that are often filter, filter feeders, like shrimp, like mussels. If you've ever eaten a clam, a mussel, a shrimp, crab, these are all animals that are looking to eat tiny little zooplankton, tiny little animals in the water and can easily mistake plastic for those items. And eventually, of course, as you see on the screen, we've got the little shrimp, which would then be eaten by the bigger fish, which could then be eaten by some of our favorite animals, like beluga whales, for example, or even maybe humans in the future, which is another part of study that many people are curious about. So this is the cycle of what we're seeing plastics happen. And then, of course, we have to ask the question of, well, what, what are we going to do about it? So... OceanWise is looking, the research team has got a couple of different projects going on. So I'm going to share with you just one or just two of the examples of how we research microplastics, what we're doing to better try to understand microplastics, and then we'll talk about everything that you can do. Because just like you're connected to that water cycle, you're also connected to plastics. And the great thing about being able to identify what the problem is means that the there's a lot of things we can actually do to stop or to make an impact. Now that we understand what's going on, there's things, actions that we can take to make a difference. So these are two of my favorite projects because I think they're quite interesting. We've got microplastics in blue mussels and we've got microplastics in the beluga food web. So two very different parts of the world. 
Uh, this video that you're going to see here is a muscle. This is a blue muscle. And this is what I mean by filter feeding. So what they do is they sit there on the rocks, they open up their shells, and you see those little tentacle things sticking out. And what they're doing is they're basically sucking the water bodies and with it to catch whatever is in the water column. They don't care what it is. They don't have eyes like we do to actually see pictures. They're just hoping for food. And all those little shrimp specks that are floating around, all the little specks in the water are actually food. Uh, those are a type of zooplankton, a little tiny, tiny shrimp. And every once in a while, they get sucked in with the water so that the blue mussel gets to eat it. Now, that's what a filter feeder does. They're sucking in the water, and they're trying to catch whatever is in the water. But this also means that they're not picky eaters. It means that if there's things like microplastics in the water, then they might accidentally suck up the microplastics. So one of the studies we were doing was trying to see if there were microplastics in mussels, uh, particularly in Columbia, in Vancouver area. And so this is how you figure it out. You take a mussel, you dissect your mussel, and you have to basically chemically digest the muscles. So with chemicals, you're baking muscle soup. It sounds gross, it kind of is. <laughs> you're making muscle soup, and then you muscle, you run the muscle stuff through the filter. All the organic things, the muscle itself, but if there's any plastics or any kind of larger uh, materials, they get stuck on the filter. And then our researcher, Julie, in the photo there, can actually count individually how many microplastics they're finding in the muscles. Now, this study was only for two years, so we have some answers, but a lot more research is needed. Uh, always more research, because the better you understand something, the more equipped you are to then make decisions moving forward. So what she found was, yes, there were microplastics in the muscles. Of the microplastics they found, uh, over 90% of those were microfibers, so the fibers that we get from clothing is really interesting. So we are seeing a lot of fibers in at least the metropolitan Vancouver water area. We don't know what that means on a larger scale. We don't know what that means on a global scale. This is just a starting point. So now this study, we're kind of getting out what we have to do to find the plastics. Other people hopefully can now use the same strategies and we can start getting more information. And the same goes for microplastics in the beluga, in the beluga food web. I'm sorry if you're a little squeamish. I think this is super cool. Uh, our researcher Rhiannon is looking at whether or not beluga whales are eating microplastics. So the middle photo is actually her dissecting a beluga stomach. Now these beluga stomachs were donated by the First Nations Inuit community uh, from Taktayaktak, which is up in the Northern Arctic Circle. And so when they do their annual beluga hunt, they will then donate the stomachs uh, to Rhiannon so that she can do her research. And we're trying to see if microplastics are all the way up in the Arctic. Now, the really cool thing about looking at a beluga stomach is that you get the entire food chain in there. So the next photo, again, is going to have some specimens. Here we've got some of the things that she found inside of the stomachs. She followed the same process as Julie, where you're basically creating the soup and you filter it out to see what's left, see if there's any plastics left. And inside the stomach in that one photo, you'll see we've got a big fish, We've got the little fish that the big fish had eaten, and we even have a little isopod, a little bug, essentially, that the little fish had eaten. So here in this one tray, you've got the entire food chain sitting inside a beluga's stomach, and this way Rhiannon can look at not only if the belugas have eaten plastic, but also to see if the beluga's food are eating plastic as well, which is really interesting. This study is still going on. We don't have a conclusion yet. She's still working on it. Uh, but this is something that hopefully other researchers can do all around the world to see just how much of a threat plastic is. Now, of course, the big question is we know plastic is out there. We know it's a threat. So this is where you come in as citizen scientists trying to understand what we can do about it to make a difference. So this is just one challenge that I have for you because again, we need to understand the problem in order to find solutions. So now that we know plastic is a problem, what is a way to do it? We wanna try and stop it at its source. So here's a challenge for you and your friends is to try and see if you can go one week without plastic. It sounds hard, but what you do is you take a jar, you carry that jar around with you and every time you're gonna use a piece of single use plastic, so single use plastic is a plastic that you use once and you throw away, just like a plastic bag, a plastic straw, candy wrappers, things like that. Every time you use a single use plastic item, you put it in the jar. 
And at the end of the week, you can compare with your friends and family to see who did the best, which type of plastic you're using the most, and maybe which types of plastic you could stop using altogether. So we do this here at the Vancouver Aquarium amongst our staff and volunteers. It is a really fun competition if you like to be competitive. And it's also a really good way for us to see what kind of plastic we're using so we can identify what we need to cut out of our lives, hopefully entirely. And that's the best way to think about it. If you imagine you've come home, imagine you just walked through the door and there's water all over the floor. Someone has clogged the sink and left the kitchen tap running and there is water everywhere. You have a mop and a bucket. What is the very first thing you should do? If the water is overflowing because someone left the tap on and you have a mop and a bucket, the very first thing you should do is always turn off the tap. Always try and stop it at its source. And that's what we recommend trying to do with plastics. It's something that every single person has the power to do. And if you want to do a little bit more, then you can also try doing a shoreline cleanup. So that means going out into the community and actually picking up the plastic that's already there so that we're trying to reduce the amount that's currently in the environment as well. So there are lots of things that you can do. What we're trying to understand also relies on your actions and your ability to help, which is a lot. Just one little change every single day can make a really big difference. So that is everything that I have to share about plastics. I would like to know if you have any questions about plastics or any of the other solutions or ideas that you might have come up with to change, make a little change in your life as well. All right, so we're gonna go through and get some questions from the classes now. So we're gonna start with Mrs. Gully's class. Uh, there is sixth grade class from Ewing in the United States. So here, I'm going to try and unmute your mic. There we go. Do you guys have any questions for Rachel? Sorry, it kind of it cut out there. Could you speak a little, a little louder? It was what plastic do you think is the most harmful, Rachel? Oh, that's a great question. Right now, we do we're seeing that single-use plastic is the most harmful because it's it's one of those really wasteful ones. So we use it once and we throw it away. So it means that we use a lot of it, and that's why it's the most dangerous right now. Uh, and personally, I think that's quite wasteful. Plastic is so cool. And it's amazing, it can do all these things and we throw it away after one use. So of all the plastics, that is currently looking to be the number one most threatening one is single use items. All right. So now we're gonna go to Mr. Bernie's class. And these are, these are grade fours from Aurelia, Ontario. Yay. So do you have any questions, any questions for Rachel? species have been affected the most by plastic? Oh, we still don't know the answer to that very intelligent question uh, because there's still a lot that we don't understand. One of the ones that I think needs a lot more study are those little animals like mussels and crabs because in the past people didn't really care about them as much. So there's a lot that we still don't know. Uh, so I would love to see a lot more care and attention go to those animals. Uh, but really, we don't know which one is the most affected because it hurts everybody at all levels of the food chain. Awesome. So now we're going to go to Miss Sweezy's Grade 5 class from Barrie, Ontario. Any questions for Rachel? Okay, right here. Okay, Charles. Um, what would we use to replace uh, one-use plastic? Ah, smart thinking. So now we know the problem. What can we do to replace one-use plastic? There's a couple of different things. Ideally, the very first thing you do is cut out plastic entirely. So refusing is the first thing to do. And to use more organic materials like glass, paper, and wood. Those are the great, uh, great replacements if you can. If you absolutely have to use plastic, then make sure you're using plastic to the very end of its life. We are never gonna be able to stop using plastic entirely, that's okay, but we wanna make sure that we are using it to the most of the most of its lifespan. So if you, can, if you try and use things like wood, paper, metal, if you have to use plastic, then reuse 
sorry, use reusable plastic and use it as much as possible. So that way we're not being wasteful. Awesome. So now we're going to go to Mr. Lachance from Winnipeg, Manitoba. I'm having trouble unmuting the mic. There we go. Do you have any questions for Rachel? Oh, yeah. Um, how many animals die from plastic on average each year? Also a good question. Also, I don't have a specific answer for that. Uh, the reason being is because the ocean covers 71% of our planet. So picture a giant pie. Three quarters of that is what the planet covers the ocean, or the ocean covers the planet. So three quarters of the pie is ocean. We've only explored 5% of that. So a tiny, tiny little sliver of our planet is actually what we understand. We know more about space than we do about the ocean. So the reason I don't have an answer for that is because there's still so much more that we have to un have to explore and understand. So maybe you could be an ocean explorer in the future and help us better find an answer to that question. Awesome. So now we're going to go to Miss McLean's class from Alberta, uh, four three split. Any questions for Jess or for Rachel? I'm having trouble unmuting the mic again. Jesse? Yeah, is that better? You, oh, that's under bay. Let's. Yep, that's us. Yep. Yeah. Okay. We'll go to Thunder Bay first and then we'll, we'll loop back around. Sorry about that. Okay. We'll go ahead. How long? Oh, wait. Uh -huh. Yep, you guys are good, Ms. Meraki. You're good. Oh, okay, thanks. Go ahead. How long has ocean plastic been affecting animals? Ooh, yeah, very thoughtful. So, Plastic was invented around the 90s, and so we think it's been around since the very start. And because it doesn't break apart into its little pieces, it's there's plastic in the ocean that's been there since plastic was first invented, which is crazy. It doesn't go away. It's still there in the ocean somewhere. <laughs> uh, so it's been a problem since the start, and it's, again, because of that lack of understanding. Uh, people used to think that the ocean was just this very untouchable void. It was just there. It was fine whatever we put into there, no big deal. Now we're starting to understand that we actually rely on the ocean for our life. And that's now why research is starting to happen. So it's been a problem since the start. We're kind of playing catch up, which is why it's so important for us to keep pushing for all these kind of explorers and researchers and artists, communicators, uh, so that we can hopefully uh, have a better understanding of what that impact is entirely. Very cool. Sorry for the trouble, guys. You want to go back to Ms. Pearson's group now and let's them. Sorry, Elise. Yeah. All right, so Ms. Pearson's group, come on up, guys. Have you ever found a fish stuck in a soda can holder? Have we ever found a fish stuck in a soda can holder? Uh, I haven't personally. We have, uh, most commonly we find the sea, when we do the disentanglements, when we go out and help the sea lions, the most common thing that we see is the packing straps. So those are the really hard plastic loops that come around boxes when you order them online, for example. And that's one of the things that we see most commonly trapping animals like sea lions. Uh, but there is a few photos online of things like turtles, for example, getting stuck in the six ring holders. And if they cannot get the plastic off and they continue to grow, plastic doesn't grow or bend, it gets stuck there. So uh, I haven't seen it personally, but there is a bit of evidence and we do see a lot of packing materials hurting animals too, kind of like the soda cans. Awesome. So I think we have time for another round of questions. So let's go back to Mrs. Gully's class if you have any more questions for Rachel. Okay. What can we do about getting all the plastic out of the ocean? What can we do about getting all the plastic out of the ocean? That is the ultimate question that many people are answering or trying to answer and maybe you can actually come up with a solution as well because we need creative ideas in order to do that i think the best thing to do is trying to stop plastic going in the ocean in the first place if we can possibly do that for the plastic that's currently in the ocean there's a couple different things people are doing one recent project is called the ocean cleanup project and it was originally created by a guy named boy and slate who, when he first came up with the idea, was actually around 16 or 17 years old, so not very old. 
And the reason was because he saw animals like sea anemones, which are the tentacly animals, sticking to plastic and eating it, which is dangerous for them. But if we could find a machine that could just stick to plastic and pick it up, that would be a really cool machine. And now he's actually starting to deploy it. So he's created sort of an ocean surface vacuum cleaner to try and ping up plastic. That's just one project. There's lots of other ideas, and I encourage you to try and see if you can maybe even invent something yourself. Awesome. So now we're going to go back to Ms. Sweezy's class. Do you have any more questions for Rachel? What kind of plastic is the most reusable? Ooh, what kind of plastic is the most reusable? That's a very good question. I, to be honest, I don't know the specific names of plastics. They're all poly something or other. And that's confusing to remember. Uh, but hard plastics are generally the best. So the reason being that soft plastics break down a lot faster than hard plastics. So if you look at something like a hard plastic water bottle, that's going to last a lot longer than a small plastic baggie, which, by the way, you can actually reuse the plastic baggies from your lunch if you just wash them out. So hard plastics are going to last a little bit longer than soft plastics. You're going to get more use out of it. Awesome. All right. So back to Mr. Bernie's class. Do you have any more questions? You gotta wait. You gotta wait. We're on mute. You're How does plastic harm humans when we eat the fish? Ah, that is also a question that researchers are trying to answer. You're all very on top of the game. I like it. Uh, so there's a couple of different ways. Because plastic is not organic, it has no nutritional value. So that's one of the biggest scares is that if you eat plastic and you eat nothing but plastic, then you're not gonna be able to survive because your body won't get the nutrients it needs. It's kind of like if you were to eat only M&Ms for the rest of your life. It would be cool, but you would not survive <laughs> because it wouldn't be good for your health. So plastic is very similar. There isn't any nutritional value. And if we end up eating too much plastic, we still feel full, but we haven't gotten what our body needs to function. So that's number one. The other problem is that plastics absorb chemicals really easily. So when they're in the ocean and they come in, in contact with any kind of toxic chemicals, they can absorb those toxic chemicals. And then if we were to eat the plastic, those chemicals would go into our bodies. So it's two things. Plastic itself is really dangerous, but plastic can carry dangerous toxins and chemicals with it as well. Awesome. All right, Jesse, I'm going to need your help with the rest of the mic because I can't see them on my control board. But let's go back to Mr. Lachance's class. Do you have any more questions? Okay. How come everyone keeps talking about this plastic problem, yet they aren't acting? Ah, smart thinking. I love it. There's a couple different reasons, and I think that you yourself can maybe tackle this problem too, because the big challenge with plastics is we're so used to using it that it's really easy to say, yeah, I'll stop. It's a lot harder to actually do it. It's kind of the same as biting your nails. Right? It's a, not necessarily a good habit, yeah. <laughs> not necessarily a good habit, but it's, it's hard to stop. And that's why we need everyone talking about it, but also everyone encouraging each other to make a difference. So that's why the plastic challenge is a good place to start because you can challenge your friends, you can support each other in this change and really make sure that you're holding each other accountable. So one of the changes that we need people to make in the future is also talking to government, is talking to fisheries, is talking to all the people that are making these promises and not following through. So actually, if you are between the ages of 11 to 18, I recommend you look up something called the Ocean Heroes Boot Camp. And this is a really cool program that actually gives you the skills that you need to then make campaigns where you yourself can go talk to government, can go talk to businesses, can go talk to people and say, you said you would do this. Why haven't you done it yet? <laughs> and it'll give you the power to do that because you yourselves, it's your future. You have the power to do that. So we really need more people talking and holding each other accountable as much as we're making promises and trying to stop biting our nails. <laughs> Outstanding. Can I just jump in to say that I love the righteous indignation in the student that just asked that question. You're awesome. Way to go. I love how, you know, what a great advocate. Um, all right, so in, in lieu of uh, trying to get the mics working, let's check in with Ms. Pearson's group. Go ahead, Lua. Question? Come on up. Have you, have you ever had an animal that you injected that had a pop tab in it? Oh, uh, that we've 
uh, dissected? Like, is that we cut open an animal to find a pop tab in it? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Okay. Um, again, I haven't personally, I would have to check in with our vet team and our marine mammal rescue team to see if they've actually found that in any of the situations. So we personally, we haven't seen it ourselves. There's a lot, again, of the entanglement issue that we deal with. But there was a recent news article about a whale that washed up with tons of plastic in its stomach. So we do know it's happening. Uh, but whether or not, because the ocean's so vast and so big, whether or not we actually see it, uh, it depends a lot on circumstance. So I haven't personally, but I would have to check with my vet team to see if they've actually um, found it themselves. All right. But great question, guys. Um, and then we'll wrap up with one from Ms. Meraki's class. If you guys have a last question, come on up. Um, if you were interested in uh, having a job in ocean plastics, how would you get a job in ocean right, plastics? Thank you for asking that. So a job in ocean plastics is really any kind of science research in general. Oftentimes we say graduate high school. That's a really big first step. Awesome if you do it then try and going to get a bachelor's degree in science of some kind. Uh, generally speaking, you're gonna wanna look at ecology or biology or uh, anything to do with science. This is great to get a degree in that. And while you're doing that, I would really recommend trying to see if you can get some volunteer experience or work experience in a lab. So get used to working with microscopes, get used to working with the equipment, to cleaning all the beakers. It's all really important and the more that you show you are passionate about something and you are really wanting to work for it and you care about it, that is really going to come through. At the end of the day, you should be doing something you're passionate about and people who are looking to hire you will see that when you apply as well. Very cool. Um, Alicia, is there any last message you want to share with classes or get classes to say a big thank you or anything else? I don't want to take over entirely here. Yeah, for sure. Um, Rachel, do you have any sort of big take home, just a reminder of what they can do to help? Yeah, again, I going back to that question of like, we're talking about it. Why hasn't anyone doing anything about it? We can do something about it. It's a human caused problem. It's a very person centered solution. We need people just like you that are looking at each other and saying, why haven't we done this? And then doing something about it. So the great thing that I think about all of you students is you are incredibly powerful and the knowledge that you're gaining today from your teachers, from your friends and family, those are tools that you can then go out and use to make change, to inform the adults that aren't paying attention, to inform the other kids that aren't paying attention. This is the very first step. So the more that you ask, why aren't we doing something about it, is great because that's a starting point to then going to make change. And don't let anything hold you back. If you wanna make change, go and find the resources. We have lots of resources to help you do that at oceanwise.org, or sorry, ocean.org, uh, but also just hold on to that passion and keep striving for something. So that's what is going to change the future. All right, awesome. If Jesse will help me unveil the classroom mics, we'll get everyone to say a big thank you. Yeah, so boys and girls, just guys get ready. I'm going to demute everybody's microphone. So, Miss Gully, Miss Sweezy, Mr. Bernie, Miss Pearson, Miss Baraki, Mr. Miss Lachance, uh, you guys are good. <laughs> Awesome, guys. Thank you so, so much. That was marvelous. Thank you to Alicia, too, for hosting for the first time ever. Way to go. Yeah. Right. Uh, Rachel, thanks for joining us again. Classes, we look forward to having you back soon. Rachel, it's always a pleasure, and uh, have a wonderful rest of your day, everyone.